Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a student and a walking tour guide. Firstly, you have some time to read questions 1 to 5. Hello, walking tours. Hi, is that Oxford Guided Walks? Yes, it is. Would you like to book a tour around Oxford? Well, I've already booked a tour, but I need to cancel it. Two of my friends can no longer make it on Friday, so we have decided not to go ahead. I'd like a refund if possible. Oh, I see. And which tour had you booked for, please? It was the Harry Potter tour. OK, do you have the booking reference number? It's on the ticket. I haven't got it with me. Well, when did you book the tour for, do you remember? It was on Friday the 15th of June at 2 o'clock. OK, let me check your name so I can find you on the system. You are? It's Dave Chu. That's C-H-O-O, is it? It's C-H-E-W. Right, I'll just get the details on the screen. I live in Plumstead, London. And did you pay by credit card or debit card? I paid by debit card for myself and four other people. Now there is a cancellation fee of 20% of the entire booking. I didn't know there was a cancellation fee. Yes, I'm afraid so. You paid £50, so the fee works out at £10. That means I can refund £40 back to your card. Do you want me to go ahead with this? If I change it to another day, will you still charge me the fee? If you wish to postpone, you can do so for a flat fee of £5. Well, that sounds better. I'll get back to you with the new booking details once I've spoken to my friends. Now you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. So what date would you like to book the new tour? Well, Friday week would be ideal. And this is for the Harry Potter tour again? We'd like to try a different tour. The Inspector Morse tour, please. Ah, now we only run that tour on a Saturday. Will that be all right for you? Yes, that's better, actually. Oh, and how long does the tour last, please? It's about a couple of hours like the other tours. We depart at a quarter to two sharp and I recommend that you aim to arrive by half past one. Right, that's fine. Can I go ahead and book? So that's five adults for the Inspector Morse tour starting at a quarter to two on Saturday the 23rd of June. Is that right? It's only four adults now. Ah, I see. I'll need to recalculate it. The Morse tour is £13 each, whereas the Potter tour was £10. So it works out at £52, plus a £5 for the change of date, making a total of £57. And you have already paid £50, so I will need to charge you an extra £7. Is that OK for you? That's great. And what is your debit card number again, please? That's the 16-digit number on the front of your card. Yes, I have it. It's 5471-4710-2382-3900. Now, if you have a pen and paper handy, I'll give you the new booking reference number. OK, I'm ready. Right, it's M236YC. And I'll post out your new tickets today. And tell me again... Where do we set out from? We meet up in Broad Street in the centre of Oxford in the pedestrianised zone adjacent to Balliol College. Is that near to Oxford Railway Station? It's about one kilometre from the station, no more than 15 minutes walk. Will you be our guide? 
Yes, I'm Jane and I'll be your guide for the afternoon. I'll be wearing a wide-brimmed hat with a red bow so you can recognise me. Oh, that's helpful. See you on Saturday afternoon. Look forward to meeting you. Bye for now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tutor explaining to a class of students the program of events for a field trip. Firstly, you have some time to read questions 11 to 16. Good morning. Can I have your attention, please? I'd like to run through the programme of events for the Northern Ireland field trip. I'll explain the travel arrangements in more detail shortly. Can I point out that the trip is not compulsory, so you may opt out if you wish. However, we recommend that you go on the field trip because it will increase your knowledge of the subject. Last year, over 75% of students on the trip achieved a top grade in their assignments. OK, I'll explain the travel arrangements and the costs once again. You'll receive detailed handouts later today, but make your own notes if you wish to. We leave here on Saturday the 10th of September and arrive back the following Saturday on the 16th. The fee for the field trip is £349. This covers the cost of the entire eight days, including six nights half-board accommodation. You will be responsible for paying for your own lunchtime meals. Your seat on the minibus and the ferry is covered by the deposit of £50, so this leaves an outstanding balance of £299 to be paid by the end of the month. We'll be travelling on the Hollyhead to Dublin Ferry, which departs Hollyhead at 20 to 3 in the morning. Yes, it really is that late, or should I say early? and it arrives in Dublin Port at about 6 in the morning. So you'll have to grab some sleep on the minibus and on the ferry. The trip by road from here to the ferry terminal will take at least two hours, and we need to arrive 30 minutes before the ferry sets sail. So I'd like to leave well before midnight. Please be here no later than half past 11. Is that clear? We'll make a brief stop midway for refreshments and to use the toilets. We can't plan for the weather, however we will know in advance if the ferry has been cancelled due to adverse weather conditions. If the sea gets too rough, we might experience a delay or have to transfer to a later sailing. I suggest that people who experience motion sickness see their pharmacist and medicate themselves accordingly before boarding the ferry. Please note that passengers cannot return to their vehicles to retrieve items once the ferry sets sail, so take essential personal belongings with you. We won't be stopping in Dublin, so no tour of the Guinness Brewery on this trip. Instead, we'll be heading for our accommodation in the village of Dundrum, which is famous for its Norman castle. The journey will take about two hours, so we'll stop for a short break en route. Now you have some time to read questions 17 to 20.
Right, has everyone received their handouts? The sheet you want has the schedule for each day on the front page and a map on the reverse side. You'll notice that there are six days of activities listed. The morning of day one, that's Saturday, is spent travelling to our accommodation. After lunch, we'll take a walk in the National Trust Nature Reserve by the sea. On the following day, day two, if the weather is fine, we can spend all day in the mountains of Morn. These are made of granite rock. Alternatively, if the weather is poor, we can split the day between a visit to the Silent Valley Reservoir, Belfast Water Supply, and a visit to the town of Newcastle, followed by a walk in Tollymoor Park. These places are shown on your map. On the morning of day three, we'll be travelling north to Port Rush to our new lodgings. In the afternoon, we'll visit the Giant's Causeway. This is Ireland's first World Heritage Site and a popular tourist destination. People come to see the basalt hexagonal columns created from an outpouring of volcanic magma. Following this, there's a nine-mile walk around the headland to the famous Carrick a Reed Rope Bridge. It's not for the faint-hearted, but you don't have to cross it. Day four is a recovery day with a tour of the Whitewater Brewery and a beer tasting session in the afternoon. On day five, we'll visit Londonderry before heading towards the Glenelg Valley to see the metamorphic rocks. On our last day, we'll travel to Bally Castle with its 150-metre-high dolerite cliffs, which are popular with rock climbers. That's on day six. After leaving the cliffs, we'll make our way back to Dublin to catch the late ferry home. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a poster presentation. Firstly, you have some time to read questions 21 to 25. How's the poster presentation going, Hannah? Well, I've made a start, but can you help me with the PowerPoint, please? Yeah, OK. Have you created a folder yet? That's the first thing to do. I've done it already, but what's the next step? Well, what size would you like the poster to be? I tried putting these four sheets together to make one big sheet, but it's still too small. OK. Well, the paper size is automatically set to 36 high by 48 wide, but the maximum width is 60. You can select it under Page Setup. No, 48's fine. That's plenty big enough. Have you decided on a title yet? Yes, it's No Footprints. Right. Well, type it into the box at the top. Now you need a large font size for the title, a minimum of 96 points, and the main text should not be less than 26 point. Maybe 48 for secondary headings. Can I change the colour of the background? You can, but don't overdo it. White is fine. How do I insert my text? It's easy. Just cut and paste it from your essay. And can I insert images in the same way? Have these been scanned in or were they taken with a digital camera? There's mostly photos that I've taken and copied into my pictures. Let's see. If I click on this picture of a wind turbine, then paste it in and resize it, OK? Yes, will it look all right or do you think it's a bit small? No, it's fine. Just make sure your images are no smaller than 50k in size, otherwise they'll look grainy on the poster. You know, uh, pixelated. JPEGs look best. 
That's great, Paul. I'll carry on now, thanks. I'll pop back in a while to see how you're getting on. Now you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. I see the poster's taking shape now, Hannah. Oh, hi, Paul. I've got all the text in now and done some editing. What do you think of it so far? I like the piece in the middle box about offsetting emissions. Where did you get that from? Off a web page. OK, fine, but you'll still have to cite it in your references. Where should I do that? At the end, in the final box on the template. Do you like the picture of the carbon cycle? It's from an old school book. Yes, I like the colours. It stands out very well. But I think you should move it and attach it to the introduction. OK, that's a good idea. I'll move it straight away. Now I need to insert this table showing carbon emissions for different types of personal transport based on official government figures. Well, just hold on a moment. Have you saved your work yet? No, i better do that first. I don't want to lose anything. Right. Now use the paste special command so it imports the table as a graphic file. This is going into the second box, is it? No, the next one after it. Yes, that looks very neat, but can I make a suggestion? Yes, go on, what is it? Well, you haven't put your name anywhere. You can put it below the title, though in a smaller font, obviously. OK, I'll do that. And it would look more professional if you inserted the college logo. Well, where can I find it? Try the college's homepage. Put it in the top two corners, then you're just about done. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a university professor giving a seminar about the history of diagrams. Firstly, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning, I'm Professor Menzies, and I've been asked here today to talk about diagrams. By way of introduction, I'd like to run through the history of diagrams from the earliest times, mainly because we need to be clear about what we mean by the word diagram, as opposed to other similar terms such as picture, illustration, or sign. Historically, it's important to make these distinctions because, for example, Rock art can be traced back tens of thousands of years, as in the depiction of wild animals in cave paintings in Europe, or in Aboriginal rock art. These probably reflect early man's respect for animals, or have religious significance. Either way, images like this are not classed as diagrams, only pictures or illustrations. Similarly, we can also discount the hieroglyphics carved into stone in Egyptian writing where pictures were used to indicate words or sounds. We still use pictures to convey messages today, for example, traffic signs to indicate speed limits, but pictures like this are not classed as diagrams. Instead, a diagram is a drawing showing a relationship between the objects in the diagram. An early example of a diagram can be found in Pythagoras' theorem of around 500 BC. 
In this theorem, the square drawn on the longest side of a right angled triangle has an area equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. 300 years later, another Greek mathematician, namely Archimedes, also a scientist and astronomer, drew numerous diagrams associated with his many theories, ideas, and inventions, which are still abound today. For example, Archimedes used geometric drawings to calculate the mathematical constant pi, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. Another well-known type of diagram is the map. Maps can be traced back over 500 years. The Wikipedia Dictionary defines a map as a diagrammatic representation of an area of land or sea showing physical features, cities, roads, etc. For example, a street map. The inclusion of axes and coordinates in maps and charts had to wait until the 17th century, invented by Descartes. In the modern era, we still think of diagrams in terms of maps, charts and graphs, but also any drawing that aids the comprehension of complex information by displaying it in a visual way. In the mid-19th century, the British nurse Florence Nightingale used a diagram resembling a pie chart to great effect when depicting the causes of mortality of injured soldiers. Mathematicians employ a wide range of diagrams, particularly in geometry and statistics. Examples include graphs, histograms, Venn diagrams, tree diagrams, and box and whisker plots. So I think it's fair to say that a high proportion of diagrams are linked to mathematical data, but not exclusively so. Flowcharts are one of the better-known non-mathematical diagrams. They were invented in the 1920s and gained popularity in the 1960s with the development of simple computer programs consisting of a set of stored instructions, which is why we're interested in them today. The elements of a flowchart are a series of boxes linked by lines and arrows. The reader starts at the top box and works downwards, or sometimes sideways, or even loops back to the original box, depending upon the instructions in the box. Flowcharts enable the reader to make the correct decision in response to questions that require either a yes or a no answer. Typically, a flowchart ensures that the correct procedures are followed in business practice, or that the correct sequence of operations are adhered to in a manufacturing process. All flowcharts use a set of geometric shapes, for example, oval-shaped boxes to indicate the start and the end of a flowchart, rectangles to enclose instructions stating what action needs to be taken, diamond shapes for decision boxes, whether the question has a yes or no answer. Lines with arrows extend from the decision box to direct the reader to the next piece of information or process to be carried out. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.